Hello, and welcome to Global Data Themes Instant Insights. At Global Data, we define a theme as something that keeps a CEO awake at night, as businesses that invest in important themes will succeed, and those that don't will fail. Hello, and welcome to Instant Insights. I'm Carolina Pinto, and today I will be talking to Rory Green, the head of China and Asia Research at TS Lombard, a leading independent investment research provider focused on global macro and strategy. In April, we had Steve Blitz on the podcast talking about the U.S. economy. And today we want to shine some light on the other big economic power, China. Hello, Rory. Thank you for speaking to me today. How are you? Hi, Carolina. Yeah, I'm great, thanks. Great to be here. So let's get straight into it. As Steve talked about in the last podcast, high inflation has severely affected economic growth across the West. This is predominantly in the US, UK and Europe. What is the inflation situation like in China? Yeah, it's it's really interesting, actually. China has a completely different inflation problem to the rest of the world. Chinese policymakers now are more worried about deflation rather than inflation. And to us, this might think might seem a bit of a non-problem. How is low price growth an issue? But the problem comes in that it reflects a very weak domestic economy. And this mainly stems from the scarring that has occurred over the past two years. So although China has reopened, it experienced three massive shocks in the past two years. It had zero COVID, property sector crash, and a big shift in the political economy to the left. And this means that the private sector is very cautious. Uh, We've got big negative wealth effects. So compared to, say, the US, Europe, East Asia, when people coming out of COVID had much higher property prices, much higher stock values, the Chinese people are coming out poorer. And this means that the economy is experiencing quite weak domestic demand, especially the industrial sector. And this is translating into very weak price growth, which is in stark contrast to the rest of the world. One thing to to note about this is this has some some different benefits and minuses for the global economy. Uh, And where markets have really got this wrong is expecting that commodity prices were going to boom because China was open, China's back. And this was completely wrong. And this is both good and bad for the world. Good. It means that China is not causing inflation, not causing commodity prices to spike, but it's bad because it's not pulling in demand from elsewhere. It's not going to help drive global economic activity. So overall, China's economy is experiencing deflation rather than inflation. And it's really down to this uh, scarring, this kind of hangover from, from COVID, from property and from these political shifts. Speaking of political shifts, after Xi Jinping's visit to Moscow in March, uh, there's been lots of discussion about the internationalization of the Chinese yuan and Vladimir Putin's blatant support uh, for the move. Is this the start of the end for the dollar's domination in the global market? Um, well, yeah, th- globally, geopolitical instability is at a record high, clearly, from, from Russia, Ukraine and, and US-China friction. We've seen a lot of headlines about the end of the dollar, the death of the dollar. And I think that is partly true. I don't think the dollar is going to be overthrown as the dominant global currency. But I do think usage of the Chinese yuan is going to increase. And really, the main driver, as as you touched on, Carolina, is, is geopolitics. America has weaponized the dollar and access to the global financial system. So the sanctions against Russia, uh, the freezing of the Russian central bank's FX reserves was a real shock for many countries, even if those countries' leaders are not planning on you know, invading a, a neighbor. They may not always be in agreement with the US, but the, for instance, India and Brazil maybe will want to continue to trade with China, with Russia and with China and avoid sanctions. So that is pushing them to diversify Uh, at least some of their FX holdings, some of their assets into the renminbi. The other major driver of this shift is China's economic heft. It is the top trade partner for 120 countries, easily the largest commodity importer in the world. And quite simply, if Beijing wants to denominate trade in the renminbi with these partner countries, it's going to happen. And there's one kind of final factor sort of pushing this greater renminbi usage, uh, and that is a dollar shortage. So some of the countries that want to use um, the Chinese currency 
Uh, the main driver is they don't have enough dollars to, to pay for goods otherwise. So they can borrow from China relatively cheaply and use that money to buy Chinese imports. So those are the drivers, geopolitics, China's heft, lack of dollars elsewhere. Why I think the dollar is still going to be king for a good while, for a, for a very long time, are a couple of factors. The first is network effects. And these are very, very powerful. Kind of think about the global dollar system a bit like um, a social media or, or kind of a messaging app. So the dollar can be Facebook maybe or, or WhatsApp. Everyone is using it because everyone else is using it. Now, China trying to get people to use the renminbi, it would be a bit like um, Carolina trying to get your mum to use TikTok, perhaps, or, or your father to use some other new social media app. It's very hard to get people to break out of that network effect into a new system. So that, that is quite difficult to change. And the other big factor behind continued dollar dominant, dominance is dollar assets are very safe, very predictable, got a high rule of law, high liquidity, and uh, they're easily accessible all over the world. The, the renminbi cannot compete at all in, in that aspect. And there really is no, no alternative on, on those categories. So the dollar will stay king for some time, but we're definitely going to see renminbi usage increase for sanctions busting, for China trade, and maybe even a little renminbi trading sphere evolve in, in East Asia. That's a great point. Out of curiosity, I know you're a China expert, but is the US doing anything actively to combat this internationalization of the RMB? Um, not really. They, they're really actually kind of inadvertently encouraging th this spread by using US dollar as a, as a weapon by instituting sanctions against a large number of countries. They are pushing people to diversify and set up alternative um, payment systems for um, to get around some of these these blocks. The other aspect, and this I think is, is a really good point to, to raise, Carolina, that for the broader U.S.-China competition at the moment, the U.S. is not really offering many incentives, many carrots to global economies, particularly uh, those that are less developed. Uh, a lot of sticks saying, you know, side with us or, or else, basically. Whereas China is is offering trade, uh, exports, demand, uh, and, and cheap loans. Um, one African leader prominently said, when the US visits, we get a lecture. When China comes, we get an airport. And this kind of, this divergence between US quite hard power approach and China's more economically aligned approach is is pretty stark at the moment. And on this metric, Beijing is is winning. That's a lovely note to end our podcast on. Thank you, Rory, so much for those instant insights. Thank you for listening. And from us at Thematic Intelligence, see you next time.